One. I have an increasing love for Cheryl. She says things to me that I never hear. She just said, you're the boss. <laughs> I, I've, never, I've never heard that from a woman in my life until now. It started with my mother, sister, um, wife, uh, chill, daughter, and finally, I think it's time to move on to the afterlife after that. I know um, my friend well. Don't get used to hearing it. <laughs> Exactly. So excited to have everyone here this morning. The ladies will start with music for us after a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for mercy and grace and kindness only found in Jesus Christ in the truest sense. Uh, simply, it is in him that we move, live, have our being. We so often forget that. So this morning, remind us through the songs that are sung, the things we hear, the spoken word as we pray in that blessed name of Jesus Christ our Lord. All of God's people said, amen and amen. I know the, how the song goes, it's just I don't even know how to play it.
how quickly I forget things. <laughs> uh, so Joe's going to be talking to us today, and I asked her just a couple of words. But if you would, you're going to give me a clue about what you're talking about. One is that Jesus is Lord, and one is that it's good to trust him. And so we're going to sing, I See the Lord, because I could think that was the perfect song for just <coughs> picturing him as Lord. So. I've been sick, so forgive me, but it's just whew, not working. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Give me a second. <laughs>
extra and a half right there. This is a hymn or part of a hymn that I brought today. We weren't going to necessarily do it. <laughs> and then we tried it. Mm -hmm. And we have to. So. <laughs> Wow, that's pretty awesome. And did you know that one day Cheryl will be playing a song like that in heaven? And when she does, it'll be perfect. And Colleen will be singing. And whatever God has given you, that's what you'll be doing. But it'll be perfected. See, hopefully this morning when we go through the lesson, we'll understand some things a bit better about what they were singing this morning, about Jesus, about him being Lord, about our trust in him. Songs couldn't have been more appropriate. We hear of things, and I'm already sidetracked, like holiness. If I were to say describe holiness, you would say most likely dull, boring, sitting around on a cloud playing a harp. But yet we know it's good. We know it's not that. It's what I just described this morning. It's God taking what's in us now that he's given to us, that he's made us for, and perfecting it. And so hopefully, the lesson will speak to our hearts. Let's bow our heads. Lord, we thank you, and we pray that 
again this morning, we would see you more clearly. That is our struggle. Or at least part of it. To see you more clearly. So I pray this morning that anything that is said would be heard as if it came from the throne of grace, not from a man of unclean lips. And anything we sing, play, would be of value to your name, the name above all names, the one of Jesus Christ, our Lord. For we pray this morning in his name. And all of God's people said, amen and amen. So just so I can see what I'm doing here this morning, um, turning that around a bit, and uh, hopefully, again, there'll be great value this morning in, in what we discuss. So Happy New Year, everyone. It's good to have everyone here in a new year. Glenn, Lori, congratulations. Grand, grandpa, two times over. So, um, I don't know if you know this, but my wife and I have nine. So, she pats herself on the back quite a bit. Uh, I just, I'm along for the ride. But, uh, congratulations. So, with the new year, start off with a question. You know, Jeopardy is a big topic of discussion now, so we're going to answer with a question. Here's your answer. According to a 2017 YouGov survey, eating healthier, number one, number two, getting more exercise, and number three, saving more money, were the top three of these. I'll give you a hint. Okay, <laughs> ladies, someone. Okay, New Year's resolutions, yes, yes, New Year's resolutions in 2017. Then I looked up the ones for 2018, and guess what? They're pretty much the same. I looked up the ones for 2019, the ones for 2020, which wasn't even here yet at the time, and guess what? They were exactly the same. Resolutions are about looking, you know, at ourselves, considering, yeah, maybe we can be better. Or maybe even there is better to be had. Our lesson this morning, and my wife had to listen to me, listen to this in Greek multiple times, so she, of course, gave me some sideways look, uh, I guess would be a kind way of, of stating it, but it's uh, dute pros ego. That's our lesson this morning. The Greek phrase dute pros ego. This morning I'm going to start with a story. The story of a young boy who grew up in a tenement with his parents, but spent most of his time with his grandparents. That young boy grew close to his grandfather especially, and he would see him get up every morning. And his grandfather would have this little pocket New Testament, and he would pray very early in the morning. He saw his grandfather do this from a very young age, and as he grew older and older, he started to see that his grandparents were very committed people of faith. Had quite a bit of superstition in there, as I think pretty much if we all admit, we all do to some degree. And they were so concerned about this young boy's eternal destination, his soul. They had this picture, and this young boy's grandmother would show him this picture from the time, I can't 
exactly tell you, probably when he was four, five, six, something like that. And she would ask him, what do you see in this picture? And the young boy would say, not much. Just a bunch of black and just a bunch of white. And some time would go by and she'd ask the young boy again, what do you see in this picture? And he said the same, not much. Time went by, one year, two years. The boy got slowly and progressively older, as we all do. And the question was always asked periodically, look at this picture, what do you see? And he said, I can't see anything. And she finally started to say, well, let me help you in what you'll see here. And she would point to the picture and tell this young boy, look here. You can see Jesus in this picture. In fact, she said it was a picture of Jesus in the clouds. And she would say, look, here are his eyes. Here are his, his nose. Here's his beard. And she would ask him, can you see Jesus now? And he would say, no. And as he got older, she became more and more concerned. She wanted this young boy to be able to see Jesus in this picture badly. And she told the young boy that your father saw Jesus in this picture a long time ago when he was very small. In fact, he even saw him go across the television. And she would come back to this picture. She recruited everyone she could to have a shot at explaining to this young boy where Jesus was in this picture. And they'd all point and tell him, here he is. Can't you see him? His eyes, his nose, his beard. And he would say, no. In fact, he never saw Jesus in this picture. But he did learn the importance of faith, of belief. And because of not being able to see Jesus, he was so troubled. He was wondering, why can't I see Jesus? What is wrong with me? They're pointing it out to me, and I can't see him. It never changed. That young boy was so fearful of the fact that I'm not going to make it if I can't find God. The years went by, and finally, an amazing thing happened. The young boy's parents, now as he's a teenager, come to know Christ. As they do, he looks and says, something is dramatically different. It caused him, me, to make a testimony of faith, to become born again, as was popular, to have a conversion, as has always been the case. When we come and say we understand and we see God now for who he is, he's Savior, and he's my Savior. Looking here at... Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, one of my favorite, and John already warned me, he said, if I leave, it's not because of heretical teaching. Yeah. So that's, that's uh, <laughs> he's, he says that'll come later after he's gone. But um, thanks, John. Um, one of my favorite verses is this one, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. It's really the reason that any of us come to Christ, come to Jesus, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. When you had that moment, when you came to faith in Christ, that's how you felt. I can remember it like it was yesterday. You feel like finally the weight. Remember, I looked at that picture. I couldn't see Jesus. The weight was lifted. I knew who he was. I was never concerned again about looking at that picture and seeing him. 
And guess what? Today I can see him in that picture. But it didn't matter. I knew faith wasn't about that picture. It was about seeing Jesus, but about seeing who he really was. Then life got in the way. It continues to get in the way. And though we read here, come to me all you who are weary and a burden, then I will give you rest. There were times when that young man who became a younger man, then an older man, then an old man, realized that, guess what? There were times when I still feel that I'm not at rest. We talked about resolutions, and resolutions are sensing something that could be better, something that seems a little broken in us. As you walk through this life, as you go from salvation, sanctification comes next. Here is another young man who had a profound conversion. Augustine of Hippo, later known to be Saint Augustine, was born in 354 AD. His mother's name was Monica. She prayed for, for him. She was a Christian woman of great faith. She prayed for him from day one, kind of like my grandmother and grandfather. But he went off and lived his life the way he wanted to did so for many years until he was 31. He said this in his writings, which are voluminous. He's written over five million words. In St. Augustine's Confessions, which are really about his life story, it's an autobiography in an era when they weren't popular, he said the following. But my sin was that I looked for pleasure, beauty, and truth not in him, but in myself and his other creatures. He describes a story of when he was a young boy and he went into someone else's orchard and stole an apple. He describes how that felt, the exhilaration of that. And then he said, but it wasn't about having the apple. It was about what I did. As I mentioned, at the age of 31, had this conversion after his mother praying for him for years. Came to faith finally in Christ. And he said the following. Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord. And our heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee. Isn't that Matthew 11, 28? It's exactly what it is, right? Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee. You heard the lady singing this morning. You saw Cheryl get emotional regarding the Lord. There's a lot of things that I forget, but there are certain things that I don't know why they stay with me like forever. And once upon a time, Cheryl had a profound question. She asked, can Jesus be Savior and not Lord, or does he have to be both Savior and Lord, or is he both Savior and Lord? And the answer, of course, is he is both Savior and Lord. But... The Savior part starts that day that you come to faith in him. And it's complete. The Lord part starts that day and is incomplete. He's working in that today. And after, at times, considering why am I not in peace, I went back to Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28. Because we have a tendency to take things in part. Dute prosego means come to me. 
The two in Greek really means toward. Come toward me. Face to face, come toward me. And Jesus says, you're weary. For years I looked at this verse and I thought, you know what, I've had those times. But those times are all the time. And we look at other people and say, that weariness that's in us, that burden that's in us, that's just me on occasion, right? That's not Colleen, that's not Cheryl, that's not Phil, that's not Donnie. They don't have that. But the truth is, that's all of us. And it's all of us all the time. So this verse takes us through the rest. You're weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke. And of course, we know the oxen in this period of time was the animal used with a yoke. Now, what's the purpose of the yoke? To have you do as an oxen what you're supposed to do. And then Jesus says about this for us, take my yoke on you and learn from me because I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. For what I have for you is what he's saying. For what I have for you is easy to bear and my load is not hard to carry. I used a couple of illustrations earlier when I said, what do you think about when you hear the word holiness? I guarantee you, not one person in this room went whoop de doo Not one. No one said, you're holy. Wow, that's great. I love being holy. Because we have a bad understanding of what it is. We don't know what it really is. And similarly, here in Matthew 11, Jesus is telling us something, and we just gloss over it so quickly. He is saying, come to me. What I have for you is easy. My load is not hard. It's not heavy. We take that as Christians, and we've changed it. It is this. What I have for you is hard. What I have for you is not what you want. That might be true, but what we have for you is not good. That's how we hear that. Totally the opposite of what Jesus is saying. You're burdened. You're weary. What I have for you is easy. What I have for you is light. What I have for you, my yoke, is easy to bear. You know, I started off by saying, and I was going to save it, but of course I didn't. When Cheryl's playing there with my wife singing, I guarantee you, once they start singing or playing, there's no load. Before, when they think, oh, I got to practice. Oh, I'm going to sing in front of those people. Why can't I just have a coffee and a donut instead. But once they're there, once they're there, there is no load. There is no burden. When I come, when I uh, have the privilege, and I mean it's literally an unbelievable privilege to talk to people and try to explain something that God is speaking to me. When I'm getting ready for it, uh, it's not easy. I don't feel like, yes, this is the most fun I can have right now. But Jesus said, my yoke is easy to bear and my load is not hard to carry. We'll move back to what Augustine had to say. He has so many quotes, but he had this one. If you believe 
what you like in the gospel and reject what you don't like, it is not the gospel you believe, but yourself. And here's the revelation. We all do that. Idolatry is self. Idolatry is making God out to be what you want him to be, what you're comfortable with him being. And Jesus came and he said, I came and you can't know the Father without knowing me. You have to look to him. And when you see him, you move to Matthew chapter 11, where he says, my yoke is easy to bear and my burden is light. I think we're all familiar with C.S. Lewis. He has this great little book called The Great Divorce. It's about the difference between heaven and hell. I mean, everyone can read this book. It's a little short book, so I encourage you to get it. Because if you want to listen to someone who's thinking and contemplating the things of God, C.S. Lewis is a master. In his book, he explains or gives us imagery so we can see more clearly what heaven and hell really is. At least in the imagery that he can provide and what it's really all about. He provides multiple examples of those who are outside the kingdom. Maybe with an opportunity to still get in kind of a purgatory, though he was an Anglican, he did look at Catholicism and understand it very well because of J.R.R. Tolkien. And he provides this one specific example of this ghost. Those who are in heaven are already solid, but this ghost, he, re he refers to them as ghosts because they're only part. They're not what they were made to be. They, not, they were not what they were designed to be by God. And he provides this example of this ghost, an oily, smoky ghost, who has this little red lizard on its shoulder speaking to him. You know, kind of like the cartoon when we'd see the angel on one side and the devil on the other side speaking to whatever character was there. And so this little lizard is speaking is speaking to the ghost and you hear this exchange and of course it's like you know do what I say and he's like be quiet and do what I say and kind of like be quiet oh yeah and then an angel comes along and says do you want me to kill it and there's great hesitation from the ghost well you know he's, tr he's trouble but uh, I don't want you to go to that much trouble and the angel keeps on asking do you want me to kill it? The exchanges continue. The excuses continue. Well, I think it's, you know, I think a gradual process is better. And the angel says, do you want me to kill it? The point obviously is self. Missing the best of God is driven out of wanting to be your own Lord. The process of sanctification is God working in us to take us daily to say, this is who you were made to be. This is who I have you to be. That example finally ends with the ghost saying, yes, kill it. The angel kills, grabs that lizard and kills it. And then you see the ghost slowly becoming solid. He becomes more and more real. Now he's a man nearly as big as the angel with broad shoulders. The lizard that was killed 
suddenly starts to change and ends up being a beautiful stallion that the man gets on and rides away into the mountains on. What C.S. Lewis is telling us there is, does something have you more than God? For all of us, it's a daily walk. This is from Luke chapter 9. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me will save it. For what does it benefit a person if he gains the whole world but loses or forfeits himself? The verse here is so tied to what we see in Matthew chapter 11. Well, what does it benefit if you really lose yourself? And the illustration I gave you from C.S. Lewis, that ghost had lost himself until that thing that had him, he finally said, kill it. I brought up the resolution thing just so that as we go into the new year God is working on us I have absolutely zero doubt I'm not claiming to be a prophet but God is working in this place he has us here he is working in this place and because he's doing that it involves me and you So I encourage you, his load is easy and his burden is light. Let's look at what God has for us, how he speaks to us, how he shows us his great love in Jesus. Again, a new, a fresh, it's a new year. Let's look at it. Let's say, Lord, show me. And if there are things in me that I have to answer the question to, may I kill it? And the answer is yes. Let's be willing. He said, my load is easy, my burden is light. And if you really want to save your life, you must lose it. I'll let the ladies um, finish up here this morning right after we have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for mercy and grace found in Jesus Christ. We thank you that you are patient with us over years and years. We understand that you're Savior. We welcome you as Savior. We welcome you as Lord, but we hold back. We keep you as we would like you to be. And we think erroneously in that regard. We have to remember. We have to understand that you have the best for us. Always, it's proven in your son who came and died. If we really believe the things we sang this morning, that you are high and lifted up, why would you bow down? Why would you come down to die? To make a sacrifice for us. It shows your great love. And you tell us that your load, your yoke, what you have for us is what you made us for. And so, Lord, work in our lives, work in this place, let your name be lifted on high, 
as we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, amen and amen. You going to give it a shot, Shushy? You going to be okay? This song, actually, right after Christmas, um, Phil and I went, drove down to Maryland to be with our daughter and her family, and we took the two little, littlest grandkids, Addie, who sang here, and little Coley, and, and our dog, and put them all in the back of the truck and headed to Maryland. It was real fun. <laughs> uh, but they were, I mean, they were great. I have no complaints, but we were visiting Cadence, my 16-year-old granddaughter, and uh, we were talking about the song, You Say, which was actually on, uh, was it um, American Idol? I think it was American Idol, a girl sang it on there. She was telling me that one of her friends danced to this song in like a school competition, and oh, oh the song's so beautiful, everybody loved the song. And Cadence said, that's a Christian song, you know? And they were like, no, it's not. And they're like, think about the words. What is the, what, what do you think the song is saying? And the, the girls stopped. I mean, it's just a song they heard. They liked it. Never in a million years did they ever think about the meaning or anything. And they were really surprised when Cadence told them it was a Christian song. Well, I guess they thought about it and maybe saw it a little bit differently. But it is a beautiful song. It's the number one song all, all, all time. Yeah. See, I didn't even know that. But the message in it is, is to us from God and that's the whole point and so we just need to listen to the words and the message Taking all I have and now I'm laying it at your feet. 
lost it guys I'm sorry I do believe and I'm human sorry <laughs> she did sorry <laughs> it was awesome so tough day today for me just a it was a great day it was a great day for you just an encouragement and a final word before we leave. We have each other. That's why we're here. One of the greatest things about the early New Testament church is it was small. Everybody knew each other. Everybody was there for each other. The songs that we sing this morning show us who we rely on. It's not, you're not relying on me, I can assure you. We're relying on each other. But... Jesus is calling us daily to take that yoke. It's not heavy, it's light. Thank you for coming this morning. And everyone is so excited for Cheryl. She's had one of her best days ever. They've given her high fives. And, and that's exactly because you know why? There's no burden. There was no burden. Lord, thank you that you're with us as we sang in that song. Our failures way outweigh our success stories. But that's why you came. And daily, we have to understand that you call us to understand differently to let things go that we cherish so much because you have better. We sang in that last song that our identity is in you. Today in a world where people are saying their identity is in this, in that, in something else, it just leads to more confusion, more brokenness because we're getting further away from who our identity really is in. You want us to ride off on the stallion, to really be who you have made us to be. So help us daily, Lord. We believe. Help our unbelief. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Okay, thank you.